Okay, we are at two o'clock at the top of the hour. Yes. So welcome to Light It Up Wednesdays, where we bring the joy and we find the lesson so we can be the lights on the ground here shining for each other. Today, my very special guest is author, flourish expert, and inspired activist, Melena Dawn. Melena has a passion for sharing inspiration and information through digital media with the hope of motivating positive action. She's also an adventurer, and she lived in Sri Lanka for 12 years, where she got to produce television about women's issues in the developing word, world. world. <laughs> she also then went on to write for the Daily Ohm. Now, I met Melena through the Alhambra Foundation, where she's currently the board chair, and she's also the communications consultant for the Unity Southwest region. She also works for the Center of Spiritual Living in Granada Hills, doing two media projects, Thoughts on Talks, Deep Dives and Digressions with Reverend Mike McMorrow, and her eco talk show, Flourish. Today, we will be discussing how we can be ecocentric in today's world. So welcome, Malena. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for making my bio sound so exciting. <laughs> well, because you are so exciting. <laughs> blah, 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 come on. <laughs> well, I hope uh, it's exciting enough for people to <laughs> stick with us on Facebook Live. Uh, well, I think it'll be fun. I think it will be fun um, because, like, especially like right now, we are going through something we have never gone through before. None of us, there's not a prototype for us to draw from our own experience on what we're going through. Now, hardly and, anybody else's experience either to draw from. Right. To get really creative. Yeah. So I feel like, okay, with you talking about, like you called it being egocentric. And so I would love to hear more. Hi, Jenny. <laughs> I would love to hear more about what egocentric means. Well, I have to admit, I kind of like the word egocentric because it sounds like eccentric. <laughs> I, I like it too. Eccentric kind of means outside of the center or off center, but ecocentric is ecologically centered. So um, everything for Flourish, which is a talk show that I've been doing at the Centers for Spiritual Living in Granada Hills, where we start with the environment and talking about nature and then connect it to everything else. So instead of starting with maybe spirit or starting with community or starting with whatever um you start with nature and then connect everything else so it makes sure that nature stays in the mix and at the center and forefront of all the actions that follow so the talk show also um it introduced ideas that anybody can do because i'm not like super nature girl. <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. just somebody who's interested and wants to find ways that I can incorporate nature and being environmentally friendly into my daily life. And so the talk show was to invite ways people can do that, but also uh, in between the monthly shows, I would host a field trip so people could physically get together and go someplace and experience nature or ecological living together for a little bit and build that community and connect with others in the community. Mm -hmm. So um, of course with the pandemic we're not gathering in person and so I've been trying different things because uh, I take everything as an experiment <laughs> as I mentioned to you off, uh, off camera. <laughs> uh, so Flourish is just another experiment to see what works, what connects with people, and then shift and evolve as we go. So this is part of the evolution, being here with you today. Wow. Now, one of the things that just made me feel so connected to you when I was deep diving into all about Malena <laughs> is you said something about it started with a B. Yes. So... Um, I remember that there had been a lot of dead bees on my driveway mm -hmm. and I started paying attention to where are they trying to get to and, and then a neighbor mentioned that he had a big hive up in his very tall palm tree and he had 
been talking to the different neighbors about what kind of service to get the bees out of the palm tree. And eventually I looked on with some horror one evening. He had just hired some day workers, uh, the kind that wait outside the Home Depot, or at least used to, who had a tall ladder, some trash bags that they put over themselves for protection, and long sticks, and they just beat the hive down. And I was, I was like, no, no, you should rehome them. Honeybees are especially, all bees, but honeybees, we need bees for survival. They need to pollinate our fruit and flowers and trees. And I thought, why doesn't he know that? Why doesn't my neighbor know that? And then shortly after that, and I started looking up organizations that I could maybe donate to, to make up for the fact that my neighbor just beat these bees. Um, hopefully, if it was just with a stick, they came back and I have noticed a hive in that tree again. Oh. <laughs> and so keeping out water um, in my back ga garden, just a little plate of water with a shallow edge because I thought maybe the bees were not able to make it across the street from my house because they were thirsty. So I have seen a bee or two drinking from the water, which makes me happy. Oh! <laughs> um, but then also I talked to, um, my hairdresser is in my neighborhood, and um, she was telling me how one of the, the strip mall stores had bees coming in, and they didn't want to pay extra money and so she just went in and sprayed them all. And again, I was like, no, why don't people know not to do that? So I thought if I could create a platform that just sort of informs people about other options, that you can call someplace and they will come and lovingly take the beehive and mm -hmm. move it somewhere. So there's a place in my area called the Valley Hive and they will come, they started their big hives by taking and rehoming beehives. And they have different orchards and um, sort of ecosystems for the bees to draw from. So then they sell the honey. You can get avocado honey, and you can get orange sage honey, and you know, this wonderful variety. Yeah. And so that's the cycle, you know, you call somebody, they find a good place, and we all benefit from having delicious flavors of natural honey. Yes. Okay, so I've never heard the term ecocentric. And so would that be when you decided you're going to research what else you could do with bees and you put the water out? Um, I think a lot of things happen at the same time. I was um, in a place in my life where I was kind of in between mm -hmm. things, projects, um, and I was looking for something to sort of say, okay, this is my next direction. And um, I'm a winter solstice baby. I was born on December 21st. And um, I saw a winter solstice event advertised on Facebook from something called the Order of the Sacred Earth, which uh, Matthew Fox is part of. And uh, there's a young woman that worked at a unity center in Northern California. And there's actually a unity online radio program uh, from them. And so I investigated, I bought the book and that kind of inspired me to see how I could connect spirituality and ecology and um, just sort of make that my, my new focus. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if I, if I took the word ecocentric from somebody else or if I just decided that I liked it. I never heard it before. <laughs> okay, I'll take credit for now. Yeah, not that, I mean, not that I've read everything that there is, but I, I love it. Now, so ecocentric, um, like how would just the average person like start being a little more ecocentric in their daily life? So especially with the pandemic, um, I thought of a few ways that people can do this from right where they are. So uh, one of the people I had on a recent episode, Erin Riley, she teaches people how to grow vegetables in their gardens. And um, 
So she said the easiest way is to just gather piles of leaves and let them decompose. It creates leaf mold, which is a really valuable composting agent and expensive if you buy it. But we can make our own leaf mold. We can also start composting, uh, which means just taking all the kitchen scraps of vegetables and fruit and um, find a corner in your garden. It doesn't have to be an official compost bin. I got one from the city of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, but you can just have a, a box or a crate, something that lets it decompose naturally. And um, eventually it turns into fertilizer that you can use in your garden and it'll be natural. Mm -hmm. So those are some ways. There's always um, green alternatives for any product that you use. So I've gotten to the point slowly over time because it's too much and too overwhelming to try to suddenly like make everything you do green. So uh, the vow of the order of the sacred earth is I vow to be the best lover and defender of the earth that I can be. And that means to me right now, starting from where we are and doing the best with each decision, each moment. So, yeah. you know, it could be that you're at the supermarket and you need to get mayonnaise. And so you decide to look at, you know, is this grown or, you know, I don't know if you can grow mayonnaise. <laughs> it's from <laughs> eggs and vinegar. Is but it is this a Monsanto product? Right. Is it, um, does it support, is it organic? Is it in a glass bottle? I mean, we have so many decisions that we can make, so we have to decide what mm -hmm. resonates with us. And then, you know, that day when I made that decision, this is a thing I actually did, um, it took me a little longer in the little mayonnaise section of the supermarket to decide, oh, what's the best choice? Mm -hmm. But I only did mayonnaise that day. I didn't do everything on my shopping list mm -hmm. that way because, again, it would have taken hours and been overwhelming. Yeah. But so just each one decision at a time when, when you think of it, mm -hmm. just do our best to be the best yeah. lover and defender of the earth that we can be. Yeah. And keeping it simple so we can keep up with it. Yeah. Yes. I like that. And while um, we're at home too, we have, <laughs> so one example, um, we throw bird seed out in the back yard for birds. And it turns out seed means that they plant and they grow. So if you, <laughs> if the birds don't eat them, uh, we have plants, bird seed plants. But we recently got a different mix and it had corn in it. We have a corn patch in our backyard now completely um, by accident. So mm -hmm. it's, an, it's another experiment. We're just like, okay, let's water it and see what happens. And what does corn look like as it grows? And you know, who knows what's going to happen, if it'll make it, if we actually have the right soil conditions and climate conditions, I don't know. But um, you can plant the seeds that are left over from the vegetables and fruits that you eat and just see what happens. I mean, we don't have to be perfect at it. I, I got a bunch of seeds and I researched and I got so overwhelmed about looking at climate zones and how much watering and mm. I thought, okay, I'm going to do this slowly. <laughs> bit by bit. I actually, I have some pictures. Should I share some? Oh, yeah. So in my, um, in my back garden, uh, this is who, I call this Jabba the Bougainvillea. I'm like Jabba the Hutt from Star Wars. Ooh. Since pop culture is one of my references in yeah. life. Um, and, you know, for my Unity Online radio show that I did for a couple of years. So this is job of the booth and via, and I don't know if I took a picture of my compost bin, but it looks like Darth Vader's helmet. This is the <laughs> corn growing. Uh, this is how it started sprouting. We're that's like, your, that's your bird seed garden. Yeah, and it's. Uh, let's see if I have chronological. Oh, this is not my back garden, but this is in my neighborhood. Somebody has maintained this ivy in the shape of a dog. And for the pandemic, they put a little mask and a sign. <laughs> so oh, these are so organized pictures. Oh, that's the front. Um, these jacarandas have a beautiful, it's a tree lined street. Mm -hmm. But you can see on the ground, there's like these petals of lavender, which are beautiful. Um, I think I 
took this picture and, and set it aside to share with you to show another way that people can just enjoy nature when they're sheltering at home is just yeah. to go for a walk in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And um, bees love to eat the flowers or drink from the flowers that are on the ground. So you have to step a little carefully at those times. Mm -hmm. This is a neighbor's house with, I just thought it was beautiful and inspiring. <clears throat> this is again how the whole front of the house is suddenly lavender on the ground. I think this is a neighbor's house. I don't know what that plant is called. Um, maybe one day I'll find out. Maybe somebody else knows. Uh, that is video of something and I'm not sure what, so I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> oh, okay, so this is, um, I took an outing. I found out that uh, the Valley Hive that I mentioned earlier is part of Topanga Nursery, which is uh, in, on Topanga Canyon Boulevard in Chatsworth near my home. And uh, they're open as long as, because it's outdoors, as long as people wear masks and keep distance, you can go look for plants or get, you know, I got organic planting soil, potting soil for my next adventure in the fall when I start planting things intentionally. Um, but it's so beautiful just to go and look at the variety of plants and, you know, dream about what you might like in your garden. Yeah. You can also watch movies. There are some great films. Um, there's fictional films like, I think it's called The Beautiful Fantastic mm -hmm. with Jessica Finley Brown from Downton Abbey about creating a garden in her backyard and how it was healing and connecting and uh, healed her in so many ways. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a documentary that I think I found on Amazon streaming called Love Thy Nature. And uh, these are dahlias. I didn't know what they were when I saw them, so I asked. Yeah. Um, and uh, just any documentary like that that makes you feel like you're outside, where you can learn. Mm -hmm. um, on Masterclass, actually, there's um, Ron Finley, who is known as the gangster gardener. <laughs> uh, and he teaches you how to plant. This is young corn. Mm -hmm. uh, how to plant in your garden in anything that you have around. Yeah. This is video of the leaf blower blowing the thick carpet of purple flowers <laughs> out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> That's a battery operated leaf blower. Okay. The way, so that it doesn't have the fumes from the, the gas operated. Okay. Um, you know, these are grow bags. Oh, interesting. Um, so I have tomatoes in there, and I got to eat my first homegrown tomato the other day. It was really tasty. <laughs> and this is from chopping down Jabba the Bougainvillea. Okay. And, and the ivy, so I'm, I'm clearing space mm -hmm. to, uh, to plant more and to have a raised bed. And, um, oh, that's my pet sparrow. We rescued him. He can't fly, so he lives in our house with us. Aww. Looks pretty comfortable, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> you said something really interesting before we started this, I think. That uh -huh. You said that, like, you would go to nature first to, like, would, like to find your center and to move into the healing. Um, yeah. Other people might go spirit first. You know, you go to nature first. How does that I feel? Think, I think at the time that I made that decision, I was in a really wounded place and the the place that I got that sense of woundedness from happened to be my spiritual home at the time. And so it made me question everything. And so I was at home healing and uh, just really heartbroken. And I would wake up in the morning and open my blinds and just look out side and see this bougainvillea that was growing without any direction or help or nurturing at all. Mm -hmm. It just had what it needed to do what it needed to do. And it was flourishing. And uh, that the ivy just kept growing and the sun 
kept coming out every day. And uh, that even if the things that I thought I was building weren't working, nature has an intelligence that continues and works and thrives. And so I thought, okay, that's something I can trust right now. Mm -hmm. I can trust the cycles of nature and going outside and just feeling the breeze or looking at trees. I'm looking at them now. I have a window in front of me. It gives a, a reminder that there is a rhythm to nature and that physically I felt better connecting to that nature when I watch a tree wave in the breeze it's like okay i can be flexible mm -hmm. i can move with outer circumstances and that there's a almost a ballet to it all there's a, a beauty mm -hmm. and so then i started noticing as i started feeling stronger and picking up my spiritual practices that i knew uh before how often I went to natural metaphors, nature metaphors, to explain spiritual principles. Ah, uh, yeah. So, I mean, even in the Bible, consider the lilies of the field. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's something that we all are connected to as humans, as, you know, beings on this planet. And so everybody all around the world can relate to planting a seed, setting down roots, mm -hmm. growing the strength of a tree, the shade, the flow from water, mm -hmm. the spiral patterns in shells and in stars. Mm -hmm. um, everybody on earth, every human has a connection and it's an ancestral connection. It goes back to our caveman days and woman, cavewoman days. Yes. <laughs> um, and that that was our connection that we were fully immersed in the natural environment mm -hmm. and as modern people we have been quite separated from it and i think part of our healing is to reconnect yeah whatever way we can yeah now so you talk when you talk about ancestral healing mm -hmm. how, so make that connection for me okay uh so I, our, if we go back to like the idea of evolution, that we came from the earth, that our cells are made of the same things of, as stars, mm -hmm. uh, we're part of the earth, we're connected, and we grew out of it. And so as our environment has changed, think of the, you know, Darwin, Darwin's theory of evolution, the things that have helped us survive are the things that get passed down to the next generation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have inherited all kinds of trauma responses, of fear, instinctive fear triggers, um, things that we do that seem perfectly natural, we don't even think about it, because it's been handed down to us. And uh, in the book, My Grandmother's Hands by Resma Menachem, he talks about how that's really at the root of uh, the issues that we're facing and that the Black Lives Matter movement is bringing to our attention for healing mm -hmm. uh, is that a lot of the racist responses that people have have been handed down from generations and it, it may be not even um, through nurture or teaching but in our cells, they're in our bodies as protective responses. And so in order to heal them, we have to get past our mind and start re-embodying, start anchoring ourselves in our body. And I feel like that also means anchoring ourselves into the planet, into the environment. Wow. We've got a lot of healing to do. As, yeah, we do. As humans. Yeah. So yeah. Well, that, that is really powerful. Yeah. And I think uh, the more people that are willing to do that sort of ancestral healing, mm -hmm. uh, 
the better chance we have as a society to make this shift that we really need to make. It's for our own survival. Um, because while we're dealing with these social structures that have been built over time by, you know, people who are doing their best in the moment, but maybe yeah. didn't have all the information we have now. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't solve how we interact, we can't all work together to save the planet, which is really saving ourselves. The planet will go on without us. Right. And maybe quite happily, <laughs> but um, it's to save ourselves and we can do better. We mm -hmm. can, we have the capacity to be compassionate and loving. We have these brains and these hearts and these spirits that can connect to each other and share love and help each other. And unfortunately, it just hasn't been emphasized in traditional learning environments and we've it may be from the the industrial age where everything became a machine that could be separated into parts mm -hmm. that we've learned to think of things as distinct and disconnected mm -hmm. but the reality is it's all connected so for example the um, Ron Finley the gangster gardener that I mentioned earlier he talks about um, planting vegetables in the any open space you can find, like the mm -hmm. parkways. And uh, he actually was taken to court. He was almost arrested. He's an African American man uh, for planting vegetables on the street, essentially. And it's like, okay, nobody should be arrested for that. That's dumb. Uh huh. And that just shows the the levels of, you know criminalizing anything that black people do, even if it's nice. Um, and so he actually went to court to fight for the right to plant vegetables in parkways and he won. And so what he does is he helps people plant fruits and vegetables wherever he can. And when communities can do it, you know that that neighbor has some fruit and that neighbor has some vegetables and you've got an abundance of this and you don't want it to rot. Mm -hmm. And so you, you share with your community. Mm -hmm. And so everybody is lifted up. Yeah. And so that helps the inner cities where people, they weren't built. His point was cities were not built for people. They were built for commerce. If it was built for people, you would walk down the street and put your <sighs> hand out and a pear would drop into it. <laughs> you know? So um, to make it habitable for humans to live lives and have self-sufficiency at least of some amount. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I learned about is tree canopies. So wherever trees are planted in a neighborhood or in a community, um, it helps pregnancies go better, uh, stress levels are lower, mm. it helps with um, air conditioning, so air conditioning bills are lower, um, it increases the oxygen in the environment, which not only has the effect on, on pregnant moms, but on everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, the crime rates are actually lower where there are trees throughout neighborhoods. And so... If what? You about, yeah. If you think <gasps> about inner cities where this investment hasn't been made, mm -hmm. they have higher crime rates, that mm. it's hotter... People have to spend more on air conditioning. They're uncomfortable. You know how irritated you can get when it's really hot and you're uncomfortable? Yeah. I mean, that leads to probably crime and all kinds of problems. It also, um, trees clean the air of uh, pollutants. There are lungs, the earth's lungs, mm -hmm. but they actually cleanse and they cleanse the water table. So runoff from the street and all the dirt. Mm -hmm. uh, the root system and the and the earth, the it, it siphons it out. So, like LA City is doing a a project where they actually are using the environment to be a filter for the water, not just the big hydroelectric dams, but making it an intentional part of how water is cleaned so that we can use it. Wow. 
That's so amazing. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so interesting that like what you're saying, it's what I'm taking in is, okay, for one thing, you said the planet would go on without us. It would thrive. It would just thrive. Mm -hmm. But if we actually put our focus on healing the planet, we would heal ourselves. That would be a byproduct of all that, right? Yeah. And so that's amazing. One of the things I, um, I loved from the film Love Thy Nature is uh, engineers are, are looking at nature, like say dragonflies to learn about aerodynamics. And one of the people that was interviewed said, you know, nature has done like 4 billion years of research and development we need to trust it. It's worked it out. So um, uh, there, there's another great organization called Bioneers, and uh, is that, they focus on all of this. Is it Bioneer, like Pioneer, but with a B? Um, yes. I was thinking okay. of like engineers, but biological okay. engineers. Um, but they, they are starting a revolution, and they put the word love in the middle of revolution um, for nature. Let me see if I have it up on my phone. Yeah, it's bioneers.org, B-I-O-N-E-E-R-S, a revolution from the heart of nature. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. So all right. Well, we are, we've just hit our 230 mark. So that was a very, very fast, <laughs> fast 30 minutes, Melina. I just thank you so much for being here today and just sharing so much interesting information. Um, you can, you can find out more about Melina and all of her adventures. You can just see in the description of this video, it has where you can find her on Facebook and it also has her flourish dot net website yes right, so you can go and on ahead. facebook at yeah Flourish. it's on facebook too but a beautiful website i'm i'm saying go check it out go well, check I'm it out i'm a web designer too so if anybody yes <laughs> web yes design, i actually found a, a a green web service so if you are interested in that they have servers and they reinvest in the planet so Ooh. Yeah, okay anything green Okay, wonderful. All right, well, we're gonna go ahead and stop live then on Facebook. So we'll say bye to everybody on Facebook. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks for being here.